Okay, yeah. apparently now I'm live. Greetings from Nera Costanza, uh, Dominican Republic here, way out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I had to turn around, but this is the MB I'm staying in. And let me pan right here. Take it a second to get used to it, but those are the mountains in the background. Oh, there we go. Turn that around. There we go. This is where, where I'm staying here. It's pretty cool. So I have been birding, so I, I got my binocs with me. And of course, bird book. And we're catching cool lizards. And of course, I've got my daughter's little pony so that I can take pictures of that everywhere. All right, so enough of that. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to introduce animal form and function. And on this animal form and function, let me write back. Hello, somebody's in here. If you want to guess, hit me up with questions, go for it. And uh, I can see in the top chat. <clears throat> but animal form and function today, you know, one of the ways I love to start this half of the semester is to really talk about what is an animal. And I'm going to try to change our views on what an animal is. So, um, yeah, I'm going to get a little mavericky here because I'm a little different on what an animal is. Okay, so of course, I in the title, I put something about uh, convergent evolution and evolutionary leaps in historical context. So traditionally, uh, sponges have been considered an animal. I learned this, you know, in uh, my college class where you you go and you take a class on diversity and you begin with sponges and work your way up, you know, through the invertebrates, through the vertebrates. And I was always bothered by why a sponge would be considered an animal. I just never really got it. I'm like, it doesn't make sense to me. So ever since then, I have wondered, well, what really is an animal? What, what makes an animal an animal? And of course, when we look at phylo phylogenetics, when you took ecology evolution, you learn that, you know, we have this tree of life and we have this animal lineage, and that is about relationships. You know, what are we related to? And uh, what characters do we have from our uh, common ancestor? So what do we share from our common ancestry? And interesting, you know, when we talk about animals, we learn that they have these characteristics. Okay, animals, like all uh, multicellular organisms or all animals, we, uh, you get a zygote, which is formed by the fertilization of the sperm and the egg. Okay, great. And then you get a round of cell division through mitosis and you form a blastula, it's just a ball. All animals do this. They, you know, they go through like, you know, a few rounds of cell division and they form this ball called a blastula. And it's from that ball that you get this, you know, invagination like this. And from there, you, you start separating out your tissues, your, your cells begin to differentiate into things like an epiderm, or sorry, ectoderm, sorry. The ectoderm is your outer, is your outer layer. The inside of the ball becomes the endoderm. Think like your esophagus, stomach, intestines, that would be endodermal tissue and all the organs associated with your digestive system. And then, you know, animals have another layer called the mesoderm, which you and I and most things that have what we call bilateral symmetry have a mesoderm. So think like your bones and your muscle between the inside, the endoderm, and the outside, the ectoderm. So the point is that animals have this, you know, these, these layers, endoderm, ectoderm, mesoderm, were of course multicellular, heterotrophic, we feed by ingestion. Being multicellular, like plants, we have trillions of cells. At least some animals do, we do. Uh, some animals may have only a few millions. And those cells differentiate into different cell types. And those different cell types uh, form organs and or tissues, organs, organ systems. Even though the simplest of animals at least have this, right? So here we go. We got these, you know, we got these layers, and these layers have our different cell types, which you know organize into different um, tissues, like muscle tissue, nervous tissue. The organize into organs, like your brain. Okay, so we get we're, we're multicellular heterotrophs. We feed by ingestion. We got these these germ layers. Animals also have symmetry. You can imagine a jellyfish. You can take they're they're circular, right? You can take a jellyfish, cut it in half in any way, and basically each half is the same. The rest of animals have bilateral symmetry. We got a right, a left, uh, top, bottom, front, and back. You guys get 
Yeah, so we have bilateral symmetry. And animals that have bilateral symmetry often have cephalization. This is my cephal region, region right here. And that, um, you know, we get all of our nervous system goods. Our brains are up there, uh, right close to where our, our, our sensory inputs are, like eyes, ears, taste, smell, right? And that makes sense because if you're moving through the environment one way, you put all your sense organs in the front, and you put your 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 brain or your ganglion mass of nerves right there in the front as well, right next to your nervous, I mean, right next to your sensory systems, so that you can quickly respond to it. And that sets up one of I think some very important things for defining animals. You know, animals, we have all these things I just said. We are multicellular heterotrophs. We have uh, these germ layers, the ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, derived from this, you know, blastula stage. We have like cells that differentiate into different um, cell types, form the organize into tissues and organs and all that. But what makes us really different is our senses and our ability to respond to the environment. We have a nervous system that allows for rapid assimilization or rapid detection of environmental stimuli and response to that and our response is multifaceted but the big thing is we move and we move using muscles coordinated by a nervous system that is a leap forward in evolution as far as i'm concerned that is really different than let's say a sponge now sponges have for a long time, probably since Carol Linnaeus first classified sponges, you know, 300 years, yeah, 250 years ago, something like that, you know, back in the 1700s, uh, we've considered sponges to be animals. But the reality is that uh, sponges lack those characters. They lack, they're multicellular, they have different cell types, but they don't really arrange into these tissues. They clearly don't have the different germ layers derived from the blastula stage, and they don't have the symmetry, and they don't have that ability to move and respond to the environment coordinated by a nervous system, which is taking in stimuli. So no muscle, no nervous systems. So because of that, you know, sponges are clearly related to animals, without a doubt. I mean, we, we clearly evolved from, we shared some common ancestor because sponges have these special type of cells called a coanoflagellate, which is like, imagine a cell and it's got a little uh, flagella coming off of it with a collar, right? So these collar cells and they beat back and forth in the sponge and they move water through the sponge, allowing them to, to feed. So they're, heter they're, they're heterotrophs. But lacking the muscle, the muscle nervous system to me is always like, why would you consider that to be an animal? So for me, an animal has to have those things. Now, it could be the case that sponges are degenerate animals. Now, we see animals that um, lose eyesight. They become much more simple. Uh, they lose some of their features. We see this in cave-dwelling animals. We see this in parasites, where they lose a lot of their, their features that their ancestors had. Be, they become degenerate. So maybe uh, sponges uh, had all of these things and lost it and you know why not i mean the kinoderms uh which are the starfish and and sea urchins they have radial symmetry they're our closest invertebrate relative their ancestor was probably bilateral symmetry probably had bilateral symmetry because they're not truly radial symmetric and as a result of of going from bilateral to a radial symmetry for whatever reason they um they may look a little degenerate which means they've lost some of those ancestral features. Now, for me, the case has always been um, pretty clear. You know, you what I would consider an animal has to have this muscle nervous system, no doubt. Like that's that's the delineation. And then I would place sponges. If you were drawing a, a phylogeny, the sponges would be, you know, uh, sister taxa to what I would call animals. You know, they're sister. They're they're clearly we shared a common ancestor. However. There's always been this pesky group of animals called the tenophores, and they're these little things called comb jellies, and they, they these little oval-shaped things that swim in the ocean. They've got these cilia that beat back and forth, and they move around, and they have this kind of really cool iridescence to them. And uh, yeah, I've always considered them to be an animal because 
Well, they have symmetry. They have a muscle and a nervous system. So they've got, they can move. It's, they get a little nerve net and little muscles that can contract and help them move. They feed by ingestion. So to me, they had that, that leap that, um, that uh, separated them, you know, from the sponges. And, but these studies were, keep coming out because what was the relationship of, of these um, comb jellies, these tinofores to the rest of life to, or, or to animal life? And they would get these conflicting results that would say, yeah, they're sister to uh, cnidarians, which are your jellyfish, which makes absolute sense to me. Like why, I mean, they look just like a jellyfish, except they don't have the stinging tentacles, which is actually the defining character of jellyfish, right? The, the stinging tentacles. But, you know, they, yeah, why wouldn't they be related to those? But the data just kept coming out and like, it, it wasn't clear where to place these things. And then this study would came, come out and place them at a split. So imagine a tree and you've got sponges here and the rest of animals coming off here, right? And maybe if, if uh, you got the split right here, you put the tenophores just right up here and then you'd have the cnidarians. Well, this one tree came out a couple years ago and put the cnidarians basal below that animal sponge split of the like sponges and you know cnidarians and then the rest of everything. And they put it below that. And I was like, I don't buy that. I, I, no, you're, you're looking at the wrong data. Well, <laughs> um, you know, you, you, everybody makes mistakes, right? You know, so I was like, ah, I'm not really buying this. And another study came out. And then another study came out. And then now, in, like, in the last few months, I was reading this, like, at the beginning of the summer or in the spring. I can't remember which. I'll, I'll post the, the paper. But basically, uh, we... We, uh, <laughs> I just read one of the comments, Stephen. I'm going to come back to you on that one in a second. But um, it turns out that these little comb jellies are really uh, um, basal. They split before the sponges. Now, that doesn't make sense because in, in, in biology, we often teach the way you draw your relationships is it's one way of doing it. it's called parsimony and it's not always the right way but there's this assumption sometimes that the least number of of uh, steps is the correct one but it has no 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 base no biological basis it's just like if the easiest path is most likely the correct one well check this out it turns out that that study placing the tocome jellies below you know before the split of animals and sponges turns out is likely true and when they look closer at the nervous system of the comb jellies, check this out. It is an independent evolution of a nervous and muscular system. So it looks like not only did it happen once, did it happen twice, and it happened before the sponge. Uh, they're, they're even more distant related to us than sponges. Sponges, it turns out, some people had questioned whether or not they were degenerate animals. Because in animals, if you remember from maybe evolution class or eco or genetics, that um, sponges that, or the animals have these things called Hox genes. They're master regulatory genes that lay out our body plan. They, they turn genes on and off and help lay out, you know, our body plan. Like we're segmented, you know, think this is a, you know, your vertebrae. Think about a vertebrae of the ribs. You got your C1, your C2, your C3. You got your T1, T2, T3, L1, L2, L3. This is your, you know, your thoracic cervix your thoracic vertebrae, your lumbar vertebrae, they're all numbered. It's Hox genes that lay out that body plan. And uh, people kept looking to see if, you know, these sponges had these remnant Hox genes indicating that they might be uh, uh, the gender animals. They uh, never really found them. They have these sort of analogs to Hox genes, but sponges, you know, they can look like a barrel. They can grow off in branches. So there's maybe a, the, the remnants or not the remnants, but the very rudimentary uh, regulatory genes, nothing like what an animal has. So the, the moral of the story is, you know, drawing animal, calling animals, you know, after the sponge split, then we got these other things called tenophores, which is an independent evolutionary origin of a muscle nervous system. Uh, I would call them para-animals if I was up to me. Uh, I would still not have them listed as animals. I would call animal one, you know, one lineage all related, all from a common ancestor that split off from sponges almost oh, 600 or so million years ago. And the tenophore would be para-animal because it, it, it independently evolved those characters. So to me, that is uh, um, quite fascinating. 
and I, I'll give you guys, uh, anybody that takes my class, I, I almost invariably ask the question, first question on test three is, what is an animal? And would you consider sponges to be an animal? And I'm going to ask you about the Tina Force because that's just fantastic. And uh, get a, if you get a chance, Google our Tina Four animals or the latest thing on Tina Fours, and I'll I'll maybe even try to post that paper for you. All right. So Stephen, since humans were hunter gatherers, have we physically evolved or degenerated? Man, that's a good question. Um, I really don't know the answer to that. You know, I um. We are evolving, and interestingly, as we were hunter gatherers, there's a lot of like, what, how did we adapt to that lifestyle? How did we adapt to that uh, constantly walking, uh, the diet, uh, the the times where we may not get a lot of food? And it turns out that like our Western style of of uh, activity um, is really bad for us. All the sitting all the highly processed foods. Uh, we never go hungry or rarely go, a lot of us rarely go hungry. We eat these processed foods that are very easily digested. Um, so we haven't exactly adapted to this new world yet and it's causing us a lot of health problems. Uh, so we kind of have the ghost of evolutionary past there. Um, I, I don't think that we've necessarily degenerated so much. We just are evolving to different selective pressures um, and interestingly, I don't know where the trajectory of ev human evolution is, but with 8 billion people, we are generating as, as a population, uh, mutations much more rapidly than we ever have in the past. And as you know, mutations are the, you know, the variation that the natural selection or any type of evolution can work on, not just natural selection, but drift, well, drift is not going to happen in our population. Um, but yeah, natural selection can act on, 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 on more genetic variation. So humans are becoming more diverse in terms of uh, more and more mutations are cropping up just because we're a bigger population now. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if we've physically evolved or degenerated. I, I, I really don't know the answer to that, but I can say we are evolving to adapt to our, our new environment. I love that question, man. That's a really good one. All right. So unfortunately, uh, I'm on my laptop here and I am not able to pull up and go through a PowerPoint presentation uh, on here. That's why I'm having to you know, basically talk without a, a presentation. And so what I'm going to do tomorrow is I'm going to review um, uh, 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 animal form and function. And on the web, uh, I've posted a few things on animal diversity. And one of the things that you can do to like prepare yourself, uh, you don't have to memorize everything. But learn, you know, what a cnidarian is. Learn what an arthropod is. Learn what a mollusk. So learn these groups right here. I'll type them out here. So cnidarians, um, mollusk, uh, arthropods, uh, echinoderms and vertebrates and i'll put in parentheses we're technically chordata um but it, it i mean when we talk about vertebrates we all know what we mean these are the groups that i want you to kind of learn um oh i misspelled nidarian but basically um, i have some youtube videos on them but very quickly when it comes to animal diversity as we talk about animal form and function i want to be able to mention arthropod and I need you to know those defining characters. So let me just kind of go through it really quickly. These major groups give you the defining characters of these groups so you can start learning them. And like I said, I've, I've got a few videos and PowerPoints on this. Um, Nidarians basically are jellyfish, hydras, uh, and um, sea anemones, right? There's a couple other groups. I'm not going to really worry about them. But they have radial symmetry, which means you can cut them in half on either end and it'll be the same. They have two germ layers, uh, ectoderm and a mesoderm. And they don't have a full, you know, alimentary canal. They just have like, it's a one, it's a two way, it goes in, they digest it, comes back up. They do not have cephalization, which means a head region. 
they uh, so they they don't have like a head that coordinates it, but they do have muscles and they do have a um, um, a, a nerve net that they can coordinate their movements with. And then um, Arthur uh, mollusk mollusks are really amazing. I mean, octopus. I mean that right there, right? In fact, there are even uh, there's concerns that they want to do octopus farming. Uh, because people like to eat octopus. I, it's not my thing, but some people really like it. And they want to do this octopus farming. And there's real concern that that could be really torturous because octopus are known to be really intelligent. They're, I mean, that's a loaded term in biology, right? But they they do exhibit uh, emotions and problem-solving abilities. And uh, they to, so to farm them, it's been thought that it could be really detrimental to like their health, their mental health. And it was weird thing about that with octopus, but they're out there and they evolved into their intelligence like twice. But uh, the the mollusk include also like not just the octopus, squid, and cuttlefish. Those are the cephalopods, which means head, foot. It also includes the gastropods, which are the snails, slugs, things like that. The snails, you know, they've got the shell. And then a, a slug is basically a snail that's lost its shell. Yep, that's a derived character. Some snails actually lose their, their shell. And then the other big one are the uh, are the bivalves. Think bi means two, valve means they've got these, these valves. So think like mussels, scallops, oysters. That, and there's a couple other uh, mollusk groups out there. One, if you ever go to the beach and you see like this, this long thing with like these seven plaques on it there's a placoderms are pretty cool too you, you only see those in rocky beaches so uh that's basically the mollusk they have bilateral symmetry arthropods arthropods are by far by far the most diverse lineage of animals on the planet and arthropods are basically they have these uh hard exoskeletons that they shed and those hard exoskeletons are, are made of chitin. And there's actually a hormone called ecdysin that they release that causes them to, to shed that exoskeleton. And in fact, they're, they're actually their entire lineage is like the ecdysin because of the, the hormone. So arthropods have this, like I said, hard exoskeleton that they must shed and they have jointed limbs. Nope. I was about to lose my can of here of uh fuel here <laughs> my, my red bull okay so that's arthropods so they got the jointed limbs and a hard exoskeleton and the arthropods are divided into groups you actually know well the insects the insects have three body parts head thorax and then an abdomen and the wings and the legs come off of the thorax the eyes antenna and all the sensory organs in the mouth of course are on the head region and the other group of uh, arthropods, you got insects, you got their sister taxa, the crustaceans. You're, you're familiar with like little roly polies? That's a crustacean it's called an isopod. Uh, most of the crustaceans we think about, like crabs, shrimp, lobster, the yummy ones, right? Those are, uh, those are Malacostraca, right? That's uh, the decapods. So, uh, and there's a lot of other small crustaceans out there, like uh, copepods and things like that. But crustaceans are mostly aquatic and marine, except for those roly polies. And insects are mostly uh, terrestrial, but some of them do have aquatic larvae, like dragonflies, mayflies, caddisflies, and stoneflies, and um, flies. A lot of flies have aquatic larvae, like mosquitoes. Uh, the other groups of arthropods, so we've got insects and crustaceans. Those are sister taxa. The other one are the arachnids. That's a large group. Um, it's actually the the arachnid is actually part of the, what's called Calicerata, which include something something as disparate as uh, 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 horseshoe crabs. But they all have this front mouth part called a calicera, and that's what makes them all the same. But uh, spiders, ticks, mites, scorpions, vinegaroons, amblypigids, those are all um, Calicerata, and almost all of those are arachnoidea except for the uh, the, the uh, meristomata, which are the, which means around the, they've got legs around their mouth. It's pretty cool. They get this mouth and they get all their legs around it. That's the horseshoe crabs. Okay. And then the other group of arthropods that you are familiar with, 
And some of you may feel a little squeamish about them, are the myriapods. And the myriapods, of course, include uh, millipedes and centipedes. So as you can see, arthropods are, are quite diverse. There's an extinct group of arthropods that are really cool. And those are the trilobites. Uh, they went extinct 251 million years ago at the end of the Permian. But they, man, they've been around for since 542 million years ago, the start of the, of the, um, uh, uh, sorry, the, the Cambrian explosion there. And yeah, they, um, man, they had a long run, like almost 300 million years, right? That's a long time for an animal. Horseshoe crab's been around for 450 million years. So, okay, that's the arthropods. Four living groups, insects, crustaceans, myriapods, and the chalicerids. And then the extinct one, which was the trilobites. Uh, there are people that still hold out still hold out that we might find a trilobite, you know, living in the Earth's ocean somewhere. Okay, the next ones are, uh, let's talk about the um, the echinoderms. So echinoderms are things like starfish, sea urchins, and um, sand dollars. They have superficially, they have radial symmetry, but echinoderms means like spiny skin. They, uh, the larvae are actually have lateral symmetry. And the reason why, it's odd, the reason why echinoderms are put as sister to chordates is because if you remember, when you get the um, blastula stage, you get the zygote and it goes through rounds of mitosis and forms a ball, that first invagination uh, forms, if you're an arthropod, a mollusk, um, or most other invertebrates, that first invagination forms the mouth. This is called protostome. Proto means first, stome means mouth. So protostomes, which are, you know, basically the arthropods and the mollusk, they, their mouth forms first, and then it invaginates again, and that will form the anus, and then you form a tube, and we have a tube, right? I mean, think of animals as a, as a tube, right, from your mouth to your butt, and all the accessory stuff around that tube to acquire food. Uh, well, when it comes to uh, the echinoderms and the chordates, that first invagination, what happens there, that becomes the anus first, and then the second invagination becomes the mouth. So we are called deuterostomes. Deutero, remember if you read the book of Deuteronomy, right, or, or familiar with it. Deuteronomy, uh, deutero means second, stone means mouth. So the mouth, so the first invagination is the anus, second invagination forms the mouth, and then we get, you know, the connects and forms the endoderm, which is our, our feeding tube. And uh, not only has that um, developmental process played out as relating us, but also the genetic data completely corroborates that developmental uh, process as well. So that would be the kind of nerves. And then of course the vertebrates, this is important. Vertebrates have a dorsal nerve cord. So our nerve cord runs down the back here we have a muscular postanal tail, except, you know, we obviously don't have a tail, but you have a little tailbone called a cossix. And that's degenerate, Stephen. There you go. I mean, that's a degenerate thing. We lost that tail over time. In fact, uh, other monkeys have it. And then the primates, we, we, yeah, we humans, we, our ancestors lost it a long time ago, millions of years ago. Uh, but we had the remnants of it. Okay. So, yeah, we got a dorsal nerve cord, a muscular postanal tail. And then we also have, this is my neck or my pharyngeal region right here. At some point, we have these things called the pharyngeal slits. They are often referred to as gill slits uh, because we evolved in the oceans, or at least our ancestors did. And those slits, those pharyngeal slits and vertebrates, they became gill arches. So if, you, if I had my PowerPoint, you could say I could show you some gill arches but that, those are the arches that fish use to extract, you know, oxygen from the water and release carbon dioxide and ammonia. Uh, but those gill arches are used for gas exchange, respiration, and fishes. Uh, those gill arches over time have evolved into other things. In fact, I think gill arch one or two, I forget exactly which one. If you take uh, ichthyology with Turner, you'll learn it. Or uh, GVZ, I think Steve Poe is going to be teaching GVZ this fall. Take it with them. You'll love the class. Uh, 
But this right here, this is a jaw. I'm a jawed fish. I'm a natha stone. Natha means jaw, stone means mouth. Uh, this jaw derives from one of the gill arches, a hyoid. There's parts of my ear, our ears, if, uh, are modified from those gill arches. So those gill arches, the pharyngeal arches, uh, they are modified into multiple structures, you know, in our head and neck region. Um, we don't have gills, obviously. So like I said, they've been modified to do other things. So going forward, make sure that you really know uh, those basic groups, because when I refer to them, we're going to talk about animal form and function. We're going to talk about homeostasis and how these um, animals maintain homeostasis in different environments, how they do respiration differently, how they uh, yeah, feed differently and things like that. And so we want to make sure that we we're aware of these of these groups. So if I say arthropod, you know that you know arthropods are have these hard exos skeletons because that's very important for their physiology. Uh, same with the vertebrates, the way we're built is very important for our physiology. And the cnidarians, you know, they don't have gills, they don't have a, a circulatory system like we do, even open or closed. So they're flat, so they have plenty of uh, gas exchange that way. All right, I'm going to stop here. That's a long time for a, a video, and I will looks like I'm going to absolutely be able to do this again tomorrow. So, um, yeah, um, same time tomorrow, we'll go over homeostasis. I'm going to see if I can get my PowerPoint to work I'm so I can throw it up there. I'm not sure, but if not, I, I know it fairly well, and I think we can just kind of walk through it. Uh, um, I'll, I'll memorize it a little bit so we can walk through it and go through the PowerPoint tomorrow for um, homeostasis. So let's see what we got. Do all intelligent animals go through civilization at some point in their evolution? You know, I, man, Stephen, uh, I hope you're taking astrobiology. And if you're worried about it being full, man, I will override you into that class if you're interested in taking it. And the answer to that would be I would almost certainly think so. Because to 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 have intelligence requires a high level of cognition right and a high level of cognition once again you you, you take your nervous system and with the head region the cephalization you start building a more complex nervous system there to to process more and more information and make more decisions based on that and then as your your environment and your your interactions become more and more complicated right uh more complex your brain uh, evolves. The, the, you, you get evolution of the of, of the brains to become increasingly complex. And in fact, there's been like over evolutionary time, we've seen like brain size has actually increased um, uh, through time. So you go from the Paleozoic to the Mesozoic to the Cenozoic, we see an increase in brain size. And for intelligence, I would I would argue that you would absolutely have to have uh, cephalization because you've got to you've got to have a, a, a enough neural connections there for like and whatever we want to define intelligence as to to cross a threshold of um, of, a, of an emergent property you got to have enough enough complexity there to have this uh, intelligence which is an emergent property of this very complex system for it to rise if you have a very simple nerve net there's basically no way for you to have like a high level of intelligence like a human. So if you're a Nidarian, you you can't have an emergent property from a, that's that complex from that simple of a system, right? So I would I would absolutely argue that yeah, if you were to look anywhere in the universe, uh, intelligence would almost always involve uh, some type of cephalization, bilateral symmetry, or some form of bilateral symmetry that would lead to cephalization, or at least you know. Uh, with the, uh, interestingly, with the art, with the octopus, their arms have, you know, they can make a little independent um, uh, uh, decisions. And so they've got, you know, like ganglia, you know, throughout their bodies, but there's still a, a central ganglion mass, a, a central brain coordinating all of that, even though those are making independent um, decisions. And in fact, even, um, even our, our, our brain stem parts of our spine actually make independent decisions for us that's called a uh, it's called a reflex you actually get a reflex before your brain even has figured out what's happened all right so Stephen, you get any more questions all right i will uh i will see you guys tomorrow <laughs> Thank you.